It's hard to predict the future, but we continue to try. There are tried and true means of doing so in financial services, but at Credit Suisse, we continue to look for new ways to expand our predictive toolbox. Researchers, for example, have learned about group decision-making from honeybees and have also tracked the spread of disease through GPS. But what do all these tools of prediction have in common? The use of data, and lots of it. So how do we make sense of that data? How do we determine what is important and what is simply noise? How can machines augment human abilities and vice versa? At our recent Thought Leader Forum, we asked these questions and more as we continue to try and refine the art and science of prediction. The role of the human in that space is to, is to do what humans do best. Um, and that's to ask questions like why and to look for patterns and to kind of find, um, you know, to explore and get lost and kind of think about how to shape and change what's already there. The machines, on the other hand, should do what machines do best, which is repeatable, relatively simplistic tasks that can be done at massive scale. Now, where they come together, I think, is the important piece, is that as the human interacts with it, that the machine should know what the human's kind of trying to do and help it along. Humans are, are really good at understanding what humans care about. The computers aren't going to decide what's important to us. The computers aren't going to decide what's meaningful to us. In any decision-making process, and this is a collective decision-making process involving several hundred individual bees, the first step is for them to find out what their options are. And this process starts then with scout bees He's uh, flying off a swarm of bees. And of those several hundred scouts that fly out, 10 to 20 of them find possible places to live. The next challenge is to winnow out the inferior sites and identify the best one. They have a marvelous communication system for doing exactly those things. It's called the waggle dance. She points in the right direction to indicate the direction to the destination. And how long she waggles indicates the distance. As they do their dance, they recruit other bees to go to that site. So you've got this race between groups of scout bees representing different sites to see who will recruit enough bees to their site to make it the winner. The bees illustrate decision making at the group level, uh, and this applies to uh, ourselves, of course, because many of our most important decisions are made by groups. Think of the Supreme Court or a Board of Trustees or a Blue Ribbon Panel. One of the biggest problems we have um, is that people who have malaria but they don't have any symptoms, so they don't know that they're spreading the disease, when they travel, they can uh, contribute to malaria transmission in communities where control programs are in place. And what we wanted to do is figure out how many infections were traveling between different regions um, of Kenya in the cell phone data seemed to provide the perfect opportunity to look at the real-time distribution of mobile phone subscribers and be able to track their movements using cell phone data records. We can not only gather data from people in places that were really hard to reach before, but we can also engage with them. And that's having a massive impact on our ability to estimate the most important parameters underlying disease transmission. We looked at all the violence, that, where people were killed, how many people were being killed, when did it happen? I started to look for um, statistical signatures. These statistical signatures were repeated across the world. From Afghanistan to Colombia, the same mathematical signatures kept emerging every time people got together to fight each other. And so this was really, um, in some ways, um, what we were looking for, but we didn't expect it to kind of be so clean. And the reason I think it's so clean is that there's a really strong survivorship bias. If you're running an insurgency against a much stronger opposition, chances are you're going to be beaten unless you organize in an effective way. It really helps to believe that uh, foresight is a skill that you can cultivate by working at it. There is an element of training and there's an element of practice and people improve from both. The other thing that works is uh, learning to use the probability scale in a more refined or differentiated way. Uh, so our best forecasters are good at telling the difference between 60-40 odds and 40-60 odds. Well you get to be good at that with practice. You'll find all kinds of spurious relationships or correlations that don't really mean anything uh, to us or not significant to solving human problems. The big challenge is can we create the learning algorithms necessary to try to digest that information and deliver the insights without drowning in the big data. I think it's absolutely critical that we uh, think about the problem we're trying to solve 
identify the knowledge gaps that can be filled by big data in rigorous ways, and we apply it in a meaningful way. And so uh, the risk I would see is that we um, overestimate uh, the capacity of big data to solve things without truly thinking hard about what are the things that we can solve and how do we solve them in a rigorous way.